Kevin, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Kosick. Kosick. Okay, thanks. You can you can pronounce it however you like. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Book Club of California's live online program titled Beauty Bound as British Propaganda, the Bengal Annual for 1830. We're just letting in participants from the waiting room now, and we'll be getting started shortly. So thanks for your patience. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Book Club of California's live online program tonight. It's titled Beauty Bound as British Propaganda, the Bengal Annual for 1830. We're going to be getting started in just a minute or so. Uh, we have participants who are still entering from the waiting room. So we are, we're glad you're here, and we appreciate your patience. We'll be with you shortly. Good evening, everyone. We have a few more folks who are still joining us from the waiting room. It's just about three or four minutes after five o'clock and we will be getting started shortly. You are in the right place if you're here for the Book Club of California's live online program titled Beauty Bound as British Propaganda, the Bengal Annual for 1830, which will be presented by Catherine D. Harris. We will be getting started in just a minute or two. So again, thanks for your patience. Okay, it's uh, about five minutes after, after the hour, so I think we'll get started. We can have other uh, attendees join us in, in progress. Thank you all for joining us. Good evening, and welcome to the Book Club of California's live online program, Beauty Bound as British Propaganda, the Bengal Annual for 1830, presented by Catherine D. Harris. My name is Kevin Kosick, and I'm the Executive Director for the Book Club of California, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening and host this webinar. Uh, tonight we have about 100 people registered for this presentation. So for those of you who are new to us, the Book Club of California is a nonprofit member and donor supported organization dedicated to preserving and promoting the history of the book and the book arts. Oftentimes we do that with a focus on the literature and history of California and the West. The Book Club publishes limited edition books. We have a scholarly journal, and we have keepsakes. We host a year-round series of exhibitions and programs like the one this evening on topics including fine printing, design, typography, bookbinding, collecting, and much, much more. If you're not a member or if your membership has lapsed and you're interested in what we do, please consider joining our century-long tradition. Our membership dues are modest, but the benefits are many. We simply cannot do the work that we do without the support of our members. So I encourage you to visit our website at bccbooks.org to join or donate to the book club. 
And now for tonight's speaker and our program. Catherine D. Harris is a professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at San Jose State University. She specializes in Romantic era and 19th century British literature, women's authorship, the literary annual, textuality, editorial theory, and digital humanities. While her traditional scholarship focuses on three studies surrounding 19th century literary annuals, including Forget Me Not, The Rise of the British Literary Annual 1823 to 1835, The Forgotten Gothic, Short Stories from British Annuals 1823 to 1831, and The Forget Me Not, A Hypertextual Archive, she has long been an advocate for digital pedagogy and open access, especially at less or less well-resourced institutions. Her latest work on 19th century British Romanticism and literary annuals published in India interrogates the poetic dissonance between the sublime and the Bengali poetic traditions. And there we have tonight's program, Beauty Bound as British Propaganda the Bengal Annual for 1830. So let me briefly tell you a little bit more about tonight's talk. In an effort to spread the authority of England, London publishers often fostered the distribution of illustrated literary annuals and other serial forms to all of Britain's colonial holdings. The Bengal Annual for 1830 was the first literary annual in India and is the centerpiece of the presentation this evening. The, the British reading materials distributed to the colonies were widely considered culturally and socially superior over the colonial or colonized subjects. But tonight we'll hear how it's been argued that the Bengal Annual breaks free from the British colonial's stranglehold on the serial and how it has also been argued that perhaps it's just another representation of Western capitalism's co-opting cultural and artistic excellence for its own glorification. So tonight's illustrated talk is gonna be followed by a digital exhibition of beautifully bound and illustrated British, American and Calcutta 19th century literary annuals. And we'll share more information on that soon. So if you have any questions for our speaker this evening, please use the chat or the Q&A function in Zoom. I'm gonna be monitoring those through the whole talk uh, and I can answer some of those questions, but we should have time at the top of the hour to take those questions and we'll curate them from the Q&A and the chat and have a discussion with our speaker. So now it's my pleasure to introduce that speaker, Catherine D. Harris, and pass over the controls for tonight's webinar. Take it away. Good evening, everybody. I'm so pleased to see such a cross um, spectrum of people in the audience today. We do have our public audience with the Book Club of California, as well as scholars and people that I know from Twitter as well. So we're gonna keep a balance between being scholarly versus let's be engaging with looking at the stuff that's on the screen here. We're gonna look at some beautiful, a lot of very beautiful books tonight. And also please forgive me as I I'm looking and reading and I'm also managing Zoom too. So we're in an unusual time. So I'm really glad that the uh, book club is, is hosting me as well so I can talk to you about this really new project that I'm working on. All right, so let's get started. So I'd like to thank the Book Club of California and Kevin Kosick for the return invitation to continue this conversation about these beautiful little books. In February 2016, we held an in-person event with about 50 of the gems from my 400 plus collection of British and American almanacs, emblems and literary annuals, poetry volumes, newspaper and magazine collection. You can see that talk at the Book Club of California's YouTube page. All of that talk was gleaned from my previous work on creating a literary history of these early 19th century British bestsellers, the thoroughly luxurious literary annual. But what I realized after giving that talk and publishing that book is that during the 19th century, England was running the largest colonization project that the world had ever seen. And by spreading its version of Christianity, government infrastructure, and educational system to places all over the world, the British Empire was forcing its ideology upon all of its colonial subjects, 
Now, what do you think that might do to those traditions and cultures that preceded the cultural invasion by the British? And how would that affect things like the introduction of the mechanized printing press to manuscript cultures that had thrived for generations prior to British colonization and industrialization? It's part of what we're going to address tonight. All of these questions provided a new pathway to think about the literary annual form and its accompanying literary and visual contents. Now, this is a new way of thinking for me. I had to be very specific about my point of view to avoid reinforcing what's called the white settler perspective of the British Empire, whereby I might simply assign the colonized subject the position of being only a resistor or submissive and compliant. No story is ever served well by creating these kinds of diametrically opposed individuals in the history of the British Empire. To help me with this perspective, I'm deeply indebted to the work of Daniel E. White, whose scholarship on serialized publications, <clears throat> and specifically the literary annuals in India, inspired me to take up some of these issues again, most of which I had shoved into footnotes in my book thinking, I'll get to those someday, or maybe somebody else will. In addition, what started as an engaging collection of scholars on Twitter became the core Bigger Six Collective, who are pushing the boundaries of scholarship in the British Romantic period, and specifically to Manu Chander for his groundbreaking book, Brown Romantics, that allowed myself and my graduate students to flip the switch and think differently about Romanticism. So let's get rolling. In an article called On the Progress and Present State of the Native Press in India, published in the Gazette Friend of India in October 1825, the author writes that, quote, the rise of the empire of the press constitutes a new, if not the most important era in the history of man. To it, we owe the discovery of the means by which the great bulk of society may be enlightened without forsaking the ordinary occupations of life, end quote. To counter this decidedly Western point of view, scholar Daniel White notes in his book, From Little London to Little Bengal, that quote, ignorance of India in England was a repeated theme in Calcutta writing. And this is certainly true of the material that we're going to investigate for today. All of Britain's publications became exports, not just as commodities representative of news, but also the literary imagination, which became one of its number one exports. For instance, Shakespeare, which many of you have probably read and heard of before. Shakespeare in the early 19th century had a great PR machine that claimed the playwright to be the world's first and only dramatic genius. Even though not everyone in the world over venerated British literary traditions or even the traditions inherent to the English language and the production of say, poetry. In thinking about these issues of empire and colonized subjects, I began tracing where literary annuals were exported to. America, of course, Germany and France, yes, because the literary annual form was an amalgamation of forms already successful for centuries in those countries. South America, where some of the publishers were shipping things like educational textbooks translated into Spanish, and where many of the British publishers had ties to the local print industry. Well, what about all of those other British colonial holdings, the West Indies, Africa, and the closest, largest holding in the 19th century, India? There were only two literary annuals produced, published in India, in Calcutta specifically. One, which is our topic today, the Bengal Annual, published yearly 1830 to 1837. Now, this is modeled on the London publisher's very popular and best-selling luxury item with gold brushed onto the edges of the pages, bound in beautiful leather, full of exquisite portraits and landscape engravings made from the lading, latest printing technology to allow for extraordinary details. A bevy of popular and best-selling poets and fiction authors work, as well as non-fiction accounts of the doings of the empire, as well as the quotidian bucolic happenings of British citizens. So I put this slide up here so that you can see the comparison of how popular were they really? Are you just pulling our leg? So you see all the way to the left is poetry for 50 year span. We've got the print editions up to 10,000, the new editions right around 5,000 with new authors hovering at 2,000 for that span. So if you take a look at literary annual poetry and the bars in that graph, you'll see that there was new poetry almost equaling 10,000 new poems as in the previous 40 or 50 years. 
and also same with the novels and the authors as well. So a lot of people were gaining a voice. After thinking further, I realized that all of these London published literary annuals were bestsellers at home in London, in England, and were wrapped in a sense of nationalism and British empire that was really British propaganda. We're going to talk about why. Then I started noticing just how many of the engravings, short stories, and poems were about India. I noticed also how many tales translated from Hindu and other languages were contained in these pages. Then how few of the colonial subjects' voices appeared, almost none, among the 350 pages of more than 300 London published literary annuals. The engravings though became more and more about India and China as the years progressed in literary annual publications in England. Readers were fascinated by these exotic lands and believed the stereotypes that entertained them. There's a term for this, it's called Orientalism. For a time period, 1830, 1800 to 1830, the British, the, news, <laughs> the, the British newspaper archive held by the British library returns a search for the term Oriental with 37,000 occurrences of the word. And they're it's used across miscellanies, articles, advertisements, illustrated magazines, and newspapers. So people were writing and talking about this idea of the Orient and Oriental before literary annuals came to prominence. But the use of Oriental doesn't mean what it means today in the 21st century. If we just take a look at this view from 1780 to 1840 and the use of beauty, empire, sublime, and Oriental. But let's define it for our purposes. What does Oriental mean? In the 19th century, the Orientalist was someone who admired Western representations of anything from India or China. And those scholars in the audience, I'm purposely being reductive for the purpose of our um, mixed audience here. Now, these could include poetry, artwork, engravings, fiction, but the Orientalist literary and visual materials were primarily from the white settler point of view, meaning the British colonialists. And they were in, intended to entertain the Western colonialists. And oftentimes they reaffirmed the power of the British empire. Rosinki Chajura offers a more focused definition concerning Orientalist poetry, which is what we get to tonight. She writes, quote, the Orientalist poems of 19th century India were on a formal and stylistic level derivative of mainstream English poetry, especially of English poetry concerned with the Orient and generally imitative of Campbell, Moore, Scott, or Byron, all very popular Romantic era poets. Yet their authors were the first poets to conceive of India as a nation, for until the 19th century, there'd been no conception of Indian heritage, still quoting, um, excuse me, I'm still quoting Chaudhuri. There'd been no conception of Indian heritage or culture in an autonomous sense as was now available in a systematized way through Orientalist scholarship. These poets therefore were drawing upon a completely new vocabulary that had come into existence with the attempts of the Orientalists to classify and structure the traditions that shaped India. Now let, let's break that down. The primary point here is that Orientalism and Orientalist literature was created by Western poets and authors, not Indian authors. But Chaduri is suggesting that this helped to shape India's nationalist literature by creating a vocabulary that was then captured and revised by Indian authors without those authors becoming passive subaltern figures. Okay, before we leap into the Bengal annual for 1830, let's back up a little and define what this thing was, this literary annual, and how it could possibly be so important as a site of both British propaganda and Bengali literary evolution, not beholden to the British Empire. 1820, 1800 to 1820 in England was part of the Industrial Revolution. Paper making became mechanized, which meant mass produced paper for daily newspapers and magazines. Hand setting of letters was no longer required due to advancements in typography and printing. That meant a real dearth of information in all types of writings and not just novels. 
people started reading about medical advancements, the body, the brain, the soul, and newspapers, as disorganized and crowded as they were, began to circulate a sense of national unity or revolution against that single unified narrative. Magazines allowed for images to circulate and embedded ads in everything began this hunger for commodities that could be exported from the British colonial holdings. Among all of this, by November 1822, the British reading public had already voraciously consumed Walter Scott's expensive novels and Rudolf Ackermann's exquisite lithographs. The next decade referred to by, to by some scholars as dormant and unproductive is in fact bursting with literary annuals such as Forget Me Not, Friendships Offering, Keepsakes, and Literary Souvenirs. The literary annual with its poetry, short stories, dramatic scenes, sheet music, travel accounts, political statements, historical renderings, classical references, description of, of Europe, stay with me, there's a lot, war accounts, artwork, portraits, lavish bindings, and bevy of famous authors all introduced a literary and visual genre that would be both scorned and embraced by England and beyond. Literary annuals are early 19th century British texts published yearly in England from 1822 to 1860, intended for a primarily middle class audience and therefore moderately priced. Initially published in duodecimo or octavo sizes, which I happen to have one right here, it fits right into my small hand. The decoratively bound volumes exuded a feminine delicacy that attracted a primarily female readership in England. The annuals were released each November, making them an ideal Christmas gift, lover's present, or token of friendship. Selling more than 100,000 copies during each holiday season, the annuals were accused of causing an epidemic and inspiring an unmasculine and unbody age, as one reviewer said, that lingered in derivative forms until the early 20th century in both the United States and Europe. Originally published in paper boards, the annuals were usually whisked away to be rebound in beautiful leather covers. By 1828, publishers employed the latest innovations in binding and switched to silk to amplify the value of the material object. Each annual typically offered a confined space for dedication, and this is embossed, so it's very tactile and you can run your fingers over and feel it. Early annuals offered practical information similar to the stationer's company almanac, but that would soon disappear in favor of more literary and visual content. Engravings were cast from popular paintings, but rarely garnered any fame for the engraver who was deemed a mere copyist and denied entrance into the Royal Academy. Often engravings were commissioned like this one. And then well-known poets were asked to render an accompanying poem work for hire, eventually much to the poet's dismay. What makes the poetry especially powerful in the literary annuals is ultimately the use of different kinds of poetic voice. One that focuses on the domestic, <clears throat> but that doesn't celebrate the war hero. One that points out the failures of the British government and the limitations on women's rational thought. And more profoundly in the prose, a voice that understands the need for a different version of femininity. This is specifically in the London-based annuals. So I want you to remember this image of a woman with an exposed breast, and we'll return to that in our story in a little bit. Everyone contributed to the annuals, both romantic and Victorian authors, even if they despised the genre, though not all were writing towards a subversive or revolutionary voice. The great idea behind the annuals is that the form allowed a space for these alternative voices. And originally literary annuals were to replace conduct books in the late 18th century, but the editors and publishers claims don't match that intention and instead include lascivious Gothic short stories where young women run away, radical poetry and pop culture ephemera. At first reviewers embraced the literary and annual genre and the long list of authors and beautiful engravings and said that it would purify the imagination and the heart. We'll come back to that too. The neoclassical embellishments adorning early annuals covers and slipcases remind readers of the three graces, charm, beauty, and literature. Publisher of the first annual, The Forget-Me-Not, Rudolph Ackerman, focused on establishing the literary annual in association with taste, 
a slippery term that denotes pleasure, desire, appetite, imagination, and shared feelings according to the philosophers Hobbes, Burke, and Kant. The engravings in the London published annuals focused on ladies' portraits as well as bucolic, botanical, and mythological imagery. Publishers and editors soon came to learn that readers wanted the beauty of the engravings as much as they desired to read the literary contents about military conquests, foreign royalty, epic romance, and Gothic tales. And some of you will notice in the upper corner, that's a William Blake engraving. The annuals were also filled with tales of faraway lands and colonial holdings, usually articulating some form of, quote, white man's burden, end quote. Now, white man's burden is not something that we strive for, it's defined in this way. It's a white settler point of view that assumed anyone outside of the Christian faith was uncivilized and lacking intellectual and cultural superiority and required the intervention of Western culture to provide sophistication, both intellectually and industrially. Well, the engravings here, all from um, the most popular London published annuals from 1823 to 1835, focus on India and rendered in the highest quality using steel plate engravings with such fine detail that often the annuals were sold with a magnifying glass for close study. Eventually, the size of the entire volume increased to eight and a half by 11, the size of a regular sheet of paper, to allow for focused close study, which of course offers a voyeuristic colonialist gaze upon the colonized other. The association with pleasure and beauty was problematic for women readers during the early 19th century. Ackerman and various annual editors would continually defend the genre as tasteful while printing literary materials that were perhaps more scintillating and aligned with the idea that aesthetic taste is rooted in physical sensation. The export of this literary annual form and the exoticizing of the Indian colonial subjects halted at the doorstep of the first Calcutta published British literary, Calcutta published literary annual. Though its editor David Lester Richardson would have certainly been familiar with both the luxurious materiality of the London literary annuals, as well as their well worn visual and literary contents. The Bengal annual published yearly 1830 to 1837 was the first of only two literary annuals published in India, the second being The Orient Pearl, published 1833 to 1835. The Bengal Annual and The Orient Pearl are both extremely difficult to find from rare book dealers and any scholarly research uh, special collections. I have my own copy though, that's why we're talking about it today. The Bengal Annual modeled after the London Annuals to extend the boundaries of home to Britain's colonial empire included both Britain, British and just a few Indian authors. So it's not a hybrid, it's not necessarily a mimicry, but it's also not the London publications either. The material aspects of this literary annual certainly don't match the pleasing luxurious boards, gilt edges, uh, superior paper, clear type and steel plate engravings that are apparent in the London published annuals. And in fact, this is it. There's nothing super fancy about it. And the paper is as thin as newsprint, so it bleeds through. That was a problem for any reader. There's also a paucity of women authors, a type of author who dominated the London published versions, especially with translated texts. The editor Richardson heralded the British literary imagination and London engravers as superior to any of the, quote, local amateurs, which is what he called them in the preface to the Bengal Annual. Though India, specifically Bengal, has a poetic tradition that spans centuries and a manuscript culture that has produced some of the richest storytelling and epics. And even if the London engravers were supposedly better, we're gonna burst a bubble right here. Many of them in the early 19th century were immigrants themselves fleeing war-torn countries to work in a London printer or publisher's basement, doing piecework on, for example, the sky or the clouds in a larger landscape uh, steel plate engraving on which they will never be able to add their names because the master engraver was the only one to get credit. Before the Bengal Annual published in Calcutta, the Oriental Annual, published in London, became popular. Rudolf Ackerman was already engaging in a colonial voyeurism through both the engravings and literature offered in this originating literary annual title, The Forget-Me-Not. 
On the left is an engraving titled Sakantala from the very popular and long running Forget Me Not published in 1825. On the right is the fruit seller from the Oriental Annual published in 1835. You'll notice that she's not clothed from the waist up. Separated by a 10 year publication span, the details on these engravings portray both women with a downward gaze, one ornately ordained, uh, adorned, staying true to the representation of the exotic other, and the other subtly eroticized as partially nude, though the shadows inhibit the full view of her breast and creates a two-toned skin color rife with ambiguity between the end of the skin and the start of the clothing that would have assuredly titillated the reader. The single exposed breast wasn't a new visual aesthetic for the 19th century British reader of literary annuals, but it was usually not sexualized and instead reserved for a maternal image. On the left is a close-up detail of the poem and the engraving's main character, Sakantala, a character from Hindu mythology who marries a warrior and then goes through trials awaiting his return. This engraving accompanies a poem that revises that mythology though, and is about an empress who dies of a broken heart. The editor, Frederick Scherbel, includes a note that this particular version of the tale is translated from the German with Sakantala as a representation of the Queen of Prussia, or Germany as we now know it, completely eradicating any mention of the Hindu myth. And it was un unusual for an editor to intercede and provide a historical note or any sort of annotation on any of the annual's writings. Here, both women are eroticized and exoticized, though their clothing and their bodies, through their clothing and their bodies, both in an attempt to reify this idea of the erotic other, captured by a woman selling fruit on the street and a Hindu empress that, in the poem, becomes analogous to a German royal. The beautiful and the sublime, both pleasing and terrifying because you never would have seen an engraving of a white British woman in either type of repose in the literary annuals. This Orientalist fashion of women on display was pervasive in British publications, especially for the middle class reader of annuals who would never venture to India for a first hand view. Now let's return to that engraving that we saw before. This is from the literary souvenir London published in 1825 called Mother and Child. We see an exposed breast by the subject. This is representative of the sublime coupled with maternity. As she's lunging for her child, who's in a deadly and precarious position, her breast is exposed to represent nursing and motherhood. But it's also a trope of the craggy cliff with unknown and dangerous heights, which for the Romantic era signals a moment of extreme fear that can cause clarity in purpose. The romantic ideal of beauty in this image is both from the natural surrounding, which is decidedly deadly instead of bucolic and serene, as well as the sublime moment for the mother. I just want to add extemporaneously, why does she let her baby get that close to the cliff? Okay, hope you're talking about that in the chat. <laughs> The cover of the Graces for 1823 also uses an image of a woman with a single exposed breast, but these are goddesses encircled in play or signaling an affinity for one another. But this image is always intertwined, dancing and exposing only one breast because it's a neoclassical depiction of ancient goddesses. It represents the daughters of Zeus who are companions to the muses and personify feminine charm. The singular exposed breast will become a motif in literary annual engravings, representing alternatively femininity and domesticity because the annuals began in 1823 and then escalated from there. The fruit seller's exposed breast, however, signals neither sublimity or maternal beauty. Instead, this is a moment of quiet repose, but one that is public and commodified on a street, selling fruit out in public but not working in this image, and therefore becomes part of the exotic scenery to be gazed upon, part of a spectacle, a voyeuristic view of everyday life in India. 
While Sakuntala doesn't have an exposed breast, this image coupled with the editor's note about translation turns this Hindu myth into a translation and analogy for that queen of Prussia. So the Hindu or the exotic is removed by the linguistic note, but the visual aesthetics signal an exotic woman who has no other role than to be beautiful and then die, unlike the myth itself. And note that this is translated from the German, which isn't unusual considering that both publisher Ackerman and editor Scherbel were German immigrants and often included German literary translations in the London published annual, The Forget-Me-Not. Once we get to the engravings of the Bengal annual, which you see on your screen here, this is all seven of them, there's no more. The complete lack of sublime and beauty is stark. No landscape images, no representations of the sublime, no overt articulation of the romantic version of beauty. And with Richardson, the editor, his disavowal of the quality of the engravings themselves and use of woodcut methods for engravings, because it was the best he could do with his quote, local amateurs. This makes me wonder about the intended readership for this annual, the Anglo Indian inhabitants or the Indian inhabitants themselves. I turned to Priya Joshi's imagery about this transactional relationship between the British Empire and its Indian colonial subjects. Quote, she writes, quote, I picture the British Empire in India with the image of two sides facing each other with their arms outstretched, each side taking, snatching, pilfering, plundering, what and when it could, but also giving, exchanging, and unevenly borrowing fitfully and sporadically, but persistently from the other transaction between the two unequal and un unequally motivated sides in an encounter that despite its unevenness was still characterized by exchange of some sort, end quote. The succeeding volumes of the Bengal Annual, according to reviews, do not have a great variety of authors as this first volume. But according to the London Annuals, that's a requirement. You must have anywhere between 20 and 40 different authors to go with the 20 and 40 different literary texts. In fact, in the, in the following volumes up through 1837, the editor Richardson himself begins to supply multiple poems and literary render, renderings which arguably turns this multi-author visual and literary form into a single author volume of poetry and prose. It seems to be about control for Richardson rather than a lack of talent. These volumes are notoriously difficult to study because only one special collection library in the US owns just two copies. To make matters worse, the Indian authors published in the Bengal Annual are not listed in the indices that we normally use to discover all of those authors who published in the 3000 American and British literary annual titles across Britain and America. The Oriental Annual or the Scenes of India published in London thrived from 1834 to 1840 and then became the Orientalist in 1841 with even more engravings of India overtaking the literary embellishments. I'm less interested in what happened with the British editor Richardson, who was also a newspaper owner and editor and dabbled in the government and educational affairs of Calcutta during this time. Instead, the next step in this project is to pick up where my graduate students left off. They've got a digital project that I hope gets put into the chat so you can see it. And what I want to do is assess the representation of beauty and the sublime in this 1830 volume in order to assess the evolution of these concepts according to the representation of both these, quote, local amateurs and engravers and the Indian authors. Priya Josi provides this idea of the company engraving, which married London and India, Indian aesthetics, but not in subversive or mimicry to the London artistry. Richard concludes the first volume of the Bengal Annual with a Greek poem translated into Bengali by a student in the newly instant, instantiated Hindu college. And, a, and he was also a, a follower of the popular Indian poet, Henry de Rosio. Um, our author, our translator here, Ghosh, not, not Richardson necessarily. In this, is this a case in 1829 of Richardson promulgating the work of homogenizing the Bengali language and promoting the work of the Hindu, Hindu college and thereby de Rosio? Richardson will go on to be appointed as a professor of literature in 1837 at Hindu college. Uh, another scholar, Gary Viswanathan, mentions that Richardson's edited volume, Poetical Selections, 
was a major textbook in the Hindu college, and it effectively established the po English poetic canon well before it was institutionalized in England. So that's another connection that I'm not sure about in tracing what was going on with the Bengal annual for 1830 and all the succeeding uh, Bengal annuals. My colleague Anupam Basu, who offers this translation on the side here, um, provided a bit of background about this type of verse and the inherent requirements of this translation that's on your screen. Um, Basu writes, quote, the verse is the rhyming couplet form ubiquitous in much Bengali medieval poetry, especially religious poetry. It's a crude sing song form associated with rustic doggerel verse that much of high literature in the 19th century literary revival would try to move away from. But the form's most prestigious instances occur in early 15th and 16th century epic poetry. End quote. Rustic doggerel verse. Compare that to what I've described as what's considered acceptable for the literary annual and its verse in London and how it gets translated into this version. Perhaps not the intention of the original annual publishers to purify the imagination and the heart with what's termed as doggerel verse. Returning back to Priya Joshi, uh, she has a theory about this type of use of everyday literature as opposed to a scare quotes the greats or the canonical literature that's coming out of England at the time. In speaking about the novel in India, she articulates or we're going to extrapolate from that into literary annuals. She proposes that readers in colonial in India didn't valorize the British novel of serious standards, but instead read, consumed, copied, translated the lesser known British novelists to create a genre of Indian novels that ascended to serious standards. In other words, readers author the same literature that they consume in India at this time. Joshi also notes in direct contradiction to that 1825 essay that I quoted at the outset of today's talk, that state of the native press, that quote, poetry was overwhelmingly the genre of literary production. More than 50% of the literature published in each presidency in India was poetry, of which a tiny and insignificant portion was in English and a large and significant output retranslated, adapted, or otherwise received its inspiration from the Indian epics." End quote. This translation closes the 300 page volume of the Bengal Annual, which is normally a position of honor and power with any literary publication and most assuredly with the literary annuals. It's not translated into English anywhere in the Bengal Annual, and it was translated by an Indian author. If Richardson supports the sentiment of the Bengal Annual's opening essay that was so incendiary and derogatory, the literati of British India, <clears throat> that disavows all these in, uh, Indian poetic traditions, why conclude the entire volume with a poem that's inaccessible to those very literati? What is purifying the imagination and the heart here? The Bengal annual selection of poems was most assuredly representative of Richardson's colonizer, white settler point of view in that he promoted Indian authors and poets that would represent only the British Empire's point of view about the apathetic native, in scare quotes, despite the long poetical tradition of Bengali literature. But these poets that were included were not necessarily passive nor resistance. Henry de Rosio was a very famous and well-known poet of the time, and there are several of his poems included in this volume. That binary <clears throat> of passive and or resistant suggests only two subject positions for these Indian poets. What if instead they are, as Rosinka Chaduri suggests, engage in quote, modes of resistance that do not necessarily occur in the, in the forms we might expect, end quote. Though Chaduri doesn't study the annuals, perhaps this is a moment to critique not the Western uh, Orientalism, <clears throat> but instead to examine, quote, an account of the confrontation between the colonizer and the colonized in which the voices of the colonized were already engaged in the formulation of an Indian identity through a unique use of indigenous heritage and history, end quote. From all of this and shifting my own perspective in studying British Romanticism and the British literary annuals from this time period, 
I definitely have a lot of work to do on the poetry of DeRosio and the serial publications that happened in and around Calcutta from 1820 to about 1840 to reestablish and get away from these two sides that have articulated already, resistance or passive, subaltern or mimicry, hybrid or something else. I want to push those aside and follow along with the Bigger Six Collective and start to articulate instead and look at how that Indian tradition of poetry evolved through, by, and away from the British literary annuals. Just in time for my voice to go away. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> I'm back. Take a drink of water. You was raced through that. That was so incredible. It was terrific. And you you told us right from the from the start, and you were right that it was going to be scholarly and engaging, which it was. Uh, I'm kind of reeling when I might like three pages of notes here, things I want to talk to you about. Um, but we also want to hear what uh, some of the attendees want to talk to you about. So we're going to give them a few minutes to kind of put some stuff in the chat. There's already some nice uh, accolades showing up in the chat. Great, thank you. Um, but if you have questions and comments that you want to make, throw it up in the, in the chat there or in the Q&A and we'll, we'll look at that and we'll talk about it. Um, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about these editors. Like I'm so fascinated by the people who were the editors of, of these annuals and what you know what what their role we really was and I guess that's part of what you're you're looking at because you mentioned that like for Richardson it was a, a, maybe about control right controlling the message and the, the whole disparaging the local talent like they they clearly played I, I think a big role in crafting the message and delivering it. Uh, did they choose all, you know, all of the authors or like, because you said 20 to 40 authors, right, for each <laughs> annual, that's a lot of people to source, like, what, what did they actually do? So the, 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 we know a little bit about the process, but not that much, so that mm. what they did was start a year earlier, and remember, there's no emailing <laughs> or <Right>. phone calling <laughs> somebody you're writing your they're handwriting letters to their friends and then they're also taking soliciting things and printing them up starting in about 1824 and that not all of the poetry in the annuals was riveting there's one that's called epitaph on a gnat crushed in a lady's album which is just literally about an at a gnat that was crushed in a lady's album that somebody <laughs> and then wrote around. So they, they spent a year putting everything together and they wouldn't always pay people. Um, they started to pay the bigger names uh, a lot at first. And then they also started to pay a lot of women poets too. Mm -hmm. So they would do proofs and then they would send it back by mail to the authors to be proofed. And then it wow. would come back. So since sometimes the author or the poet would get an engraving and then they would have to write a poem to that engraving, which at first mm. they thought was really cool and then they didn't think it was so cool. So <laughs> it was quite the undertaking and the editors did not get rich off of this. They, they sometimes put their own money forward. So mm. Richardson would have ostensibly started this work in 1828 or 1829 before he sent it to press to be published. Wow. And I see, I just want to follow up on that because I see in the chat, somebody asked uh, who these editors were. Some of them were just, um, not many of them were part of the famous group of authors that we might study now. They're people who were well known in the industry and were writing for newspapers and reviews. And by 1828, we do get women who are becoming the editors and they do mm -hmm. select a different voice. And it's really interesting to read Fisher's Drawing Room uh, Scrapbook uh, and then a couple of other of them um, the keepsake was also edited by Lady Blessington starting in 1829 and 1830. Mm. So you're, you're responding to the question about the women writers and editors and the role that, that women yeah, play. With, you, with listening to you and looking at the chat and multi Yeah, you're multitasking. That was, good. <laughs> that was what I was going to kind of morph into after talking about the editors and the role they played, then kind of talking more about the women's role and how women got involved and, and what, what they did. Uh, someone also asked if you could remind us about some of the, the stats, like on the, the, the numbers printed, uh, the quantities distributed. I, I, Can we go backwards? Don't look at the screen. You'll get, you'll get nauseous. Um, yeah, go, I, go backwards I, and look at it because you were mentioning the 100,000 in sales. In, in one year, in, in just one year, one year, in one season. 
And these were huge retail successes. And there, that's crazy. 70,000 pounds of <laughs> titles in 1828. So they were primarily, the ones that I study are primarily published in London mm -hmm. um, because that was where you had printer's row and you had the most engravers and people. And it diversified from there starting about 1829. But the one that I talked about tonight specifically was published in Calcutta, India, and all uh, the editor himself resided in Calcutta as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in Bengal. So it was really unusual. And the, we don't have any evidence of if the Bengal annual was then shipped back to England to be sold. I'd have to do a little more work. And I think maybe Daniel White has has that work that he's done already in his book as well. So it's totally worth looking at. Yeah, that was a question I had about the, the Oriental annual that you said was published in London. Was that distributed in London and also distributed in elsewhere or? You, I, I guess you're, yeah, we would love to, to say that. yes. <laughs> we know, but the records are so spotty, and yeah. the, things like you have to go to bank records and see where mm. they were sending things. I know a lot about Rudolph Ackerman because he kept records of everything, and he had his sons involved in his business. So I could we could see where he was opening a publishing house in South America, and then he that's where he started the Spanish textbooks translations as well. Mm. But we don't know for sure if things got to Calcutta or any other place in India specifically. We know it went to America and we have records of that, all the literary okay. animals themselves because they got stolen by the Americans. The Americans pilfered a lot from the British. <laughs> Shocker. <Yeah>. Uh, <laughs> um, th there is a question about how scarce these are now because they were huge quantities, but they're kind of ephemeral, I guess, right? They're, or, or are they easy to acquire? Well, I think when I was doing my graduate studies in New York at the Grad Center, uh, our research library was the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue, which is mm. the one with the two lions sitting out front. So they have a great collection, but it's not accumulated in as a collection that you could start to see the literary history of everything. So mm. I started acquiring them from online booksellers for fifteen dollars, and the and. Now I have amassed a full run of all of the major literary annual titles. So it's like a straight flush of 12 <laughs> of, the, of the best ones. Like the 1820, the um, Forget Me Not runs 1823 to 1847. I have every year. But once you started acquiring and filling things in, it gets really difficult. For some reason, the 1829 Friendships Offering is incredibly difficult to find. Mm. It's extremely rare. And sometimes I'll see things go on sale like the Seattle Public Library sold off all of their special collections and I nabbed quite a few of them. Mm. And not in great condition, but I can see what the contents were. Now for the ones, um, the Bengal Annual and the Orient Pearl are completely absent. I can't, I was lucky to find this one. I can't remember how I found it, the Bengal annual, but Stanford has the 1832 and 1834 Bengal and then nobody else. So I do oh. know that the um, India's National Library does have them in their digital repository, but I have to be there <laughs> in order to see them. To so, access them. Yes. Yeah. That's so is, is that your library behind you that we're, we're looking at? Is that Yes, that's 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 one part of it. So these are all just scholarly books behind me. And then the top shelf are cat ones I haven't cataloged in my own collection. They were sent to me by a scholar who retired and didn't know what to do with her literary annuals. Mm. And then I'm just going to move my screen just a teeny bit. Right here is a um, shut full bookshelf. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And it's chock full. Nobody come and take these. Oh, <laughs> Full of literary annuals all up and down. So I have about 400 of them cataloged and collected purposefully with getting full runs. And then also I have 15th century emblems and almanacs that are made of paper that are very, very delicate. Uh, so I wanted to get almanacs and all those kinds of things to see actually what the precursor to the annual looked like. So I collected with a purpose. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it's gonna go when I'm done with them though. <laughs> so, how, so since some of them are probably fragile and you mentioned even the, the paper is so thin on um, the Bengal, I think annual that the type bleeds through, like how do you store them? How, how are they just on, on a shelf? On a yeah. shelf. <laughs> <laughs> on a shelf in California where it's relatively dry. Um, it's not like Arizona, but 
uh, it's in a room that's enclosed by itself that doesn't get light shed onto it because that's super important for anybody who's collecting. Mm -hmm. Don't have things in full light and don't have a lamp right near it. So it's encased in um, glass. It's not, you know, it, it's not archive quality like maybe my institution would have, but it keeps them safe. But I also want people to touch them and not be afraid of them. Right. We talked a little bit about that because the, the presentation you did at the book club, you had a, kind of a show and tell. You had the annuals out and you invited people to feel them, right? Manhandle your collection, so to speak. And I think that is, that's incredible because, you know, then you could really, I wrote some, some notes about it because then you can really, you know, feel it, the, the beautiful silk that was used, right? Or the leather bindings on things or the embossed covers and title pages and, and things like that. So I'm sorry that the, the pandemic has not allowed us to do that kind of thing, but maybe the next time we, we grab you at, at the book club, we'll do you this. Did, you would see this beautiful slip case with paper boards coming out of this one. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I'm, I'm missing not being able to do that. Um, so since you're, pr you're pretty good at looking at the chat, you wanna maybe choose a question or two in here about, um, some of the very specific references is a Rudyard Kipling reference in here. Yeah. I, I want to go back to one I just saw. Somebody who knows something that um, <laughs> I write about this in my in my book, and I don't recognize everybody's names on here, so uh, I'm gonna answer just like a general public audience. So, um, one of the things that I just saw it. Somebody was asking about Vita Sackville West resurrecting yeah. the annuals. It's the towards table. the bottom. It's fourth from the bottom. There you go. So I write about that in my book in like the, the afterward mm -hmm. because it, the publisher said, this is really long. You need to cut these chapters about the 20th century and modernist version of these. But Vita Sackville West and a couple of other publishers tried to resurrect the annuals and actually reprinted um, the green paper boards of, and this size, um, Duodecimo, and included what they considered a calendar in the first instantiation. And then afterwards they started doing original poetry in the next years. And then it just sort of faded away. And one of the things that they did that was very different is because it was modernist and artist books, they also started to use handmade paper for these 350 pages, which is insane because it's really difficult to print on. Uh, they only ended up printing, I think about 70 to 100 of them before they kind of gave up the project. And mm. the literary annuals themselves at about 1830 started suffering from the reviewers saying that they're terrible, they're women's work, they're the sweeping of uh, author's desks, which was completely not true. But as people looked back and read these reviews going into the 19th century, they thought, we don't, we, they're not worth anything, so we're not going to keep them. It was usually mm. a family that was collecting them. And then when we hit the 20th century in the modernist period, early 20th century, um, the collectors and special collections, um, the librarians looked at them and said, look, reviewers said these were terrible. We just threw them away. So they didn't keep major collections. So myself, University of South Carolina, Paula Feldman, we have the three best collections in all of the world with um, American and British literary annuals. Mm -hmm. I've had grad students come to my house <laughs> <laughs> to look at my collection. <laughs> I've just been like, <laughs> don't let yeah. the cats out. <laughs> that was the only thing. Yeah. So the person, thank you for asking that question, whoever asked it, because it, it, we never let these go. Um, they were intended to be an extension of the almanac and quantifications and calendars and being able to write stuff. And I write about this in my book as well. Um, they just became things that were no longer acceptable to write in them. So we got rid of the reader in that in that instance. What happens to the reader? So so uh, there's a, one or two more questions that you might want to look at in the, in the chat. And there's one in the q and I I don't know if you can even see the oh, Q&A. Not even looking it, at the q and Okay, I'll look at it. It's long. The second one in there is kind of long. But um, but there's some good questions in there. But I was, you know, you were, you were commenting on why people didn't collect them or they got rid of their collections. But what what was the the heyday of the, the British or any of these annuals. And then why did it stop? Like, what, why was it discontinued? Was it financial? Was there just no demand? Like what? 
No, there was demand. Demand continued through about 1840. And then uh, the, the, the lore is that women's magazines really came to a height in England and America. And so then just took over. But also starting about 1830, there were all these review uh, newspapers that, that came out monthly or weekly. And they would just reprint sections of the annuals. And they cost significantly less. It was 12 sure. pounds for an annual but to buy one of these new pa- newspapers is maybe 12, maybe five shillings. Mm. So people could get the content from the annuals itself if they wanted to pos- possess the material object, which was a marker of middle class and luxury, right. they would buy them then. Mm-hmm. But they didn't, the single author poetry volumes didn't lose um, any cachet at this time. And it certainly wasn't an anthology. There was more that went into it, but the heyday was really 1823 to 1830. Mm -hmm. And my first book, I write about 1823 to 1835. And then I stop. And then Lorraine Kustra writes from 1840 to 1865 about the Victorian annuals. So we had some really good bookends for it altogether. And they, they, um, I don't have a good answer for that other than it was very expensive to produce them. The silk covered ones were extremely expensive. The engravings were very expensive to buy the rights to, uh, and people wanted more and more engravings. And so mm-hmm. they kind of got gutted. They just gutted the the market as a commodity. And yeah. then they lost, and then people lost control of them because the plates would be stolen from the publishers. And in America, they would just reprint the plates and then tip in a new title page and say, voila, American. <laughs> Well, so they lost did control you, of it, right? Yeah, there is that question in the chat about the engravings. Did you see that one about the? Oh, miss, I missed that one. It's uh-huh. toward the bottom. Uh, if you want to find it, you mentioned that there were seven engravings, are the only seven, and that the landscapes in these don't quite have the same sense of sublime uh, yeah. in, in the landscapes. So these are the woodcuts, right? In the, yeah, the woodcuts. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's anything to be made of depictions of plants in six of these seven images? Do these engravings correlate to the text included? Random yeah. questions. <laughs> Hi, Jen. <laughs> I recognize some of my colleagues. Um, a, that's so, great. I love that question because I love engravings. <laughs> the, the botanicals and literary annuals, um, it was really thought that women were very good at botanicals in England and Euclidean uh, geometry. So hmm. botanicals were placed into uh, literary annuals as a form of, uh, as a continuing engagement with botanicals. Uh, a lot of the botanical engravings in the literary annuals don't include the pistol and the stamen and the roots because I was too sexual. Oh. Number one. Um, mm. Number two, it was encouraging women to then copy and draw the botanicals or name them and learn about mm. um, all of those kinds of things in English art and stuff like that. But what those engravings in the Bengal annual, first of all, would cut so not much, as much detail and I can't zoom into them because I don't own them. That's from a black and white PDF in the internet archive. Okay. So I can't zoom in to see them in the way that I did with the two engravings from Sakantala and the and the fruit seller. Seller. Yeah. So it's but it's it's not the same. It's something that I have to explore yeah. more. But I also want to look at the way the engravings are articulated. But like comparing the sky, because it was Indian engravers comparing the the sky and the artistry of the sky in that one versus the sky in some of the landscape and bucolic scenes and the other mm-hmm. angles. But I want to be very careful not to compare as if the Indian um, engravers and authors are substandard. I don't want to make the British ones the standard that they have to reach up to. I want to look at them. Sure. Yeah. But it's hard to turn off, you know, like, oh, the botanicals and everything. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. But I, I love that question about, like, who were they for? Who was the audience of the, the Anglo-Indian um inhabitants or the Indian inhabitants, right? Like yeah. kn- knowing that, that. I don't know. I'm, I mean, I, I, <laughs> this is where I'm at a loss and the people I, I see, Preeti Joshi and Man- Manu Chander was in here for a while. So I was like, they would know because they know much more about the history okay. of the Hindu college, uh, with things that I'm just uh, associating myself with now and reading voraciously constantly. Mm-hmm. I have to remake all of my research outside of that British colonialist point of view, which is the way I'd already, already done it before. So right. my, my response is, I don't know. I, I, know. Do, I do want to respond to a couple of the chat. Yeah, go ahead. And just Here's, so for others, people know that I threw up in the, the chat, the link to uh, Forget Me Not, The Rise of the British Literary Annual. Yeah. Uh, 
from 1823 to 35 because you mentioned that and yeah. it's in libraries that. you know my my publisher wants me to say go buy it but it's also available in libraries <laughs> don't want your own copy we love libraries and we love people to collect and buy for their own library so do both so <laughs> Michael Sack at, says there's a website at the University of Miami, Ohio with facsimiles of many annuals. I know that's yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> that was one chapter of my dissertation. And then Laura Mandel adopted it when she was at the University of Miami, Ohio. And then she also put all of that data into the Poetess archive. That's more of a database. So that's what we call a, a legacy digital humanities project. I never went back. Once, once I started on the job, I was like, oh. I don't want to learn, you know, my SQL and everything and coding and programming. I knew just enough to get me to there, but it's done in frames, mm. which is extremely old school and it yeah. probably will break soon, but it hasn't broken in 15 years yet. So I'm just hanging on to that. <laughs> and Did, the, the other one I wanted to say sure. from, from Michael Hancher, uh, and this is also Kevin, something that you were getting to, how do the digitized facsimiles compare to the actual books? They don't. Um, you'll notice in what I did here, I spent a long time in, with the images here in the slideshow to make it look like they popped off the screen so it didn't get flattened. But one of the issues with a database about literary annuals is that you lose that materiality of the object. What I do like is the ability to go, go to do this. Wait, wait for it. <laughs> to do that. Because uh, I had a friend do photography and he did really high quality TIFFs so that we could zoom in and this is steel plate engravings, which means they use acid or what's called a burin to, to score those lines into it. And then the ink would sit on them as they press them into the paper. But you can see how intricate that is. I mean, look behind the fruit cellar over here. This, these are clouds and trees. So one person would have been responsible for doing that. And that's the benefit of the digital, but the mm -hmm. downfall of the digital is that you can't feel the, the silk boards or the silk covers on the keepsake and see how it's stained or used or how re readers dog-eared the pages or things like that. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for that question, um, Michael. Did you, uh, did you see the question about Rudyard Kipling? And uh, uh, Let me see, let me see if I can. Yeah, go. thoughts on the works of Rudyard Kipling. I thought some of his serialized or first published works were in India. They were, and the thing is that um, Rudyard Kipling is one of these hybrid forms of British individual. He's an expat, but he's also part of the colonial gaze, mm. but he also didn't fit into England when he went back there to go to school, so he went back to India. Uh, I don't do a lot of work on Kipling other than just reading him for enjoyment, but uh, he was serialized all right, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna guess. <laughs> I don't know. That's my response to it. But he, if he was serialized in newspapers in India, I haven't looked that up, and I'd I'd be interested just for research rabbit holes to hear about. <laughs> you know, Daryl. <laughs> I don't want to guess to give anybody the wrong information. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there was the one in in the Q and A, but uh, Kirsten said that you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. <laughs> so it okay, was so a long me, question. Yeah, let me just read it. Um, yeah. She's, um, Kirsten Lunar is at Santa Clara University and also does a lot of digital and romantic stuff. So she's really good in her own right. She says, mm -hmm. uh, from studying Emma Roberts poetry, and by the way, Emma Roberts is included in, in this Bengal annual. I believe DeRosio was a radical Indian teacher that helped her edit her book while it was at press. I had interpreted the relationship as Roberts aligning herself with DeRosio, but do you think that maybe he sought out British writers in Calcutta and that they might have helped him network or publish? In other words, maybe she was the connection for him. They're both in the Bengal annual, yes. Uh, I don't have a response to that, but Manu Chander's book, Brown Romantics, I bet you would have a response to that. Emma Roberts um, wrote a lot about India and not about not in this very derogatory orientalist way. Instead, in one, um, I don't think that she did this for the Bengal annual, but in another annual that she was writing for, one of the London published ones, she compares the British peasant to the luxury and the beauty of the body of the um, Indian everyday worker and says that the British peasant is really lazy and ugly. 
whereas anybody that you meet from India is lithe and beautiful, no matter what kind of work that they're doing. So she's got a different point of view here. And she was also serialized in a lot of the newspapers in India herself. But Manu's book would know about Derosio. He does a full breakdown, not just of Derosio and his history, but Derosio along with Keats and other philosophers at the time to try to get at, I think, the question that you're asking here. And Elizabeth says the Miami link isn't a, didn't appear in the chat. Oh, oh, to the to the Miami version. Oh, Kevin, would you mind dropping that back in? Do you still? I, I never, I never did that. Okay. I, I don't have that one on the list. I have it the Ohio swallow. Is, oh, oh, okay. Is, um, is what's in there, but that's the only, I don't have the, you, the one gonna, that you're you, talking about. I, um, I don't think it's on this list. I'm it's gonna, not. I didn't okay. even know <laughs> that. It's so old. Um, but let me, I'm going to drop the name of it in here. You can Google that. It'll be the oh, first. Yeah, second. there you go. Yeah. yeah. Hypertextual archive, of, because nobody writes hypertextual anymore. It's digital or virtual, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna, uh, I just wanna do something and uh, stop this share and I hope you can see, Ooh, I'm looking for, I'm looking for our, um, the virtual exhibit. Uh, it's in the chat right now. You can click it from there. Okay, cool, that's what I want. <laughs> I was ahead of you. Hypertextuals now digital. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we promised we would share more information on this, and this is the perfect time because we're a little after the hour here. So we'll we'll share this. So I'll, if you want to mention, go ahead. Yeah. So I have been talking to Kevin for over a year. We've been trying to get together to do a digital exhibit, and we were going to do an in-person exhibit as a Christmas gifts and what that meant for the literary annuals. And I wanted to be able to leave an exhibit up that members could just come, could go look and see what's going on. But what a digital exhibit allows us to do is really to see inside these literary annuals. And a lot of the stuff that I've mentioned today come from the exhibits themselves. And Kevin was kind enough to create different um, different tags that you can see from this digital exhibit. You can click on any one of them. Let me see if I can view all 42 items. <laughs> and there's descriptions that come with them. And the last, the very last page will be anything that has to do with uh, India. That's one of the tags. And you can see the tags right here. So if you click on them, for instance, the Almanac Memorandum of 1816, Hang on a second, all of my Zoom screens are in the way here. <laughs> Click on there the it is, it came there up. You, you get the full screen uh, of all of these um, high quality images and you can take a look at it. You can download them and blow them up and, and uh, then take a look at the hatch marks. It was always intended for everybody to be able to browse them as a sort of collection. And, and us also as a way for you personally to start figuring out, do I wanna start collecting something and how do I put that together? So. Everything I wrote into there is the reason or the rationale about why I started collecting and what that meant. And I don't collect outside of those parameters because then my house would be too full. <laughs> and I wouldn't own a car. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we hope you'll go check out the, the, the digital exhibition. The link is in the chat, but it will also be in the follow-up email that everyone will receive tomorrow, along with some other links of the things that we talked about today. Uh, so if you didn't capture them from the chat, you will get them in the, in the follow-up email that will go out tomorrow. Um, we're, we're about 6.15, so we should start wrapping up. Uh, Catherine, is there anything you want to say as some closing remarks before I close it out for, for everybody? I just really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to a different group here. And I really love the fact that this allows us to invite all the scholars in as well. And so we can have some cross pollination and talk. And I hope to be back with everybody in another year if uh, together as we go visit the room of the Book Club of California, because magnificently beautiful in San Francisco. So if you're not a member, it's totally worth being a member. Well, thank, thanks for that little plug. And we would love to have you back to do a, a live in-person uh, presentation uh, on, on this so people can actually experience all the annuals and on your collection up close. We would love to do that. So I, I, now I want to thank you. Uh, thank you uh, so much for this uh, terrific talk. And even though I'm not a grad student, 
I am coming to your house <laughs> and I'm going <laughs> through your collection. Um, uh, we'll do it with masks and social distancing and all the right protocols, uh, but that is going to happen. Uh, so Just thank you. Let thank the cat out. <laughs> uh, I won't let the cat out. So thanks. <laughs> thank you so much for this great, great talk uh, and presentation and for working on that exhibition, the, the digital exhibition with us. I think it's going to be terrific. People should definitely check it out. And I want to thank everyone who's still with us uh, for attending this Book Club of California program tonight. I, I hope you'll consider joining us for our next online program, which is Charmian Kittredge London, trailblazer, author, and adventurer. And it's tomorrow. We have back-to-back -back programs. It's tomorrow night, December 10th, from 5 to 6.15 p.m. here on Zoom. You should have received an email uh, about that, or you can go to the website and register for that Zoom meeting. It's a co-hosted presentation with the Pasadena Public Library, our monthly program with them. And that's gonna be a live online presentation by Iris Dunkel, who is the author of the book and the former poet laureate of Sonoma County. And you can register again for that event online at bccbooks.org slash programs or using the link in the weekly programs email that you may be receiving from the book club. So thanks everyone for joining us. We really appreciate you having you here. Uh, have a terrific evening. Be well and take care of yourself. Thanks. <laughs>